Okay, welcome back everybody. I'm going to chapter six, this is the last chapter of the book, and I've only got three sections in it. But I'll probably split each section into two videos, so six more videos. We're calling it nonlinear PVEs of higher order and numerical methods. I mean, there, I guess there's nothing special about necessarily tackling the nonlinear parts of these PDEs. I mean, any PDEs of higher order are gonna be able to be handled by these, because I guess linear is a very specific set of nonlinear. But more or less, we were only able to handle nonlinear PDEs of first order in the past was method of characteristics. And we were able to handle linear BDs of second order. So second order linear. Really these spectral methods, the spectral theory. Um, however, you know, you can probably get away with second order or even higher order linear problems with spectral theory. You just can't really play the spectral theory game with nonlinear PDEs. Um, so we're going to tackle a few techniques on how maybe we would actually analyze these sorts of problems in this chapter. And of course, all these techniques really are, are numerical in nature. So we don't really have good ways of finding closed form solutions to anything of higher order or nonlinear. In section 6.1, we're starting with the cauchy kovalev theorem. And I could have probably called this section power series methods. That's really what we're going to be analyzing here. But the cauchy kovalev theorem basically tells us that, that power series methods are going to be valid. They're going to be valid for a specific set of PDEs. So, you know, we're going to spend really this entire video kind of figuring out what is that set of PDEs for which the power series me methods are valid. And then we have to look at um, making sure that we, we satisfy all that criteria if we ever want to apply the power series. So we're going to start with this word analytic. And if you've taken a course in complex analysis, you probably use that word all the time. It means something in, in a non-complex analysis situation. The, the word analytic, when applied to functions, just means that the function, so function f, so it's called analytic, fits equal to its Taylor series. So there's nothing more complicated than that. So equal to the Taylor series, nothing more complicated than that about analytic functions. Uh, but you want to be careful because actually a lot of functions are not analytic. So this is a this is something that I think when you go through calculus, it really feels like everything you work with is analytic. That's because Analytic functions are kind of the ones that calculus works for. Not all the way, but you know, undergraduate calculus. And so because of that, you kind of feel like everything is analytic, but that's certainly not the case. There's all sorts of functions which are not going to be equal to a Taylor series. But we do give those a specific name, analytic. And I've got an example here. What do you know? It's just a composition of one, two, three analytic functions. Um, the composition of analytic is analytic as well. Because of course you can just you know, plug each Taylor series into one another and then rearrange terms to, to arrive at a new Taylor series. Um, so this one's going to be analytic cosine of sine of the magnitude of x squared because cosine is equal to its Taylor series. Sine is equal to its Taylor series. I'm missing an equal sign here. And the magnitude of a vector is just a polynomial. It's a quadratic polynomial as long as it's the magnitude squared. So those are our three analytic functions and then their composition is going to be analytic as well. So that's an example of analytic. Here's kind of the classic example of a non-analytic and yet smooth, right? So this function is going to be smooth, even though it's not analytic. So what I mean by smooth is we can take infinitely many derivatives and we can try to produce a Taylor series from those infinitely many derivatives. And we're going to find out our Taylor series does not equal our function. So if you define the function as e to the minus one over x squared, when x is non-zero, and then you just decide that it's going to be equal to zero when x is zero, mostly because that's just not defined at zero, you would be dividing by zero in the exponent. But certainly, if you take the limit as x goes to 0 of that function, you will recover 0. So this function ends up being continuous. And in fact, it, it actually is infinitely differentiable at 0. And you can show pretty quickly that every derivative will end up having a value of 0 at 0. Well, if every derivative exists and has a value at 0, but you try to construct the Taylor series out of those derivatives, what do you get is you plug it into the Taylor series. And every single one of those terms is 0. So the Taylor series at 0 is going to tell you that your function is equal to 0. And we know that's not true. The function is equal to e to the minus 1 over x squared, at least in some region, right? Some region around 0. So the Taylor series, well, technically it converges at 0. It converges to the, to the function 0. And it's equal to the value of the function at that point. There's no region, no open ball around that region for which it's actually equal to the function. So this is kind of your classic example of a smooth and non-analytic function. And there's another example of non-analytic functions, and those are just the functions that are not differentiable, right? So anytime you have a derivative that doesn't exist, wherever you're trying to center an analytic function, so if I try to center that x naught, and then for some reason the derivative doesn't exist, that's not going to be analytic either. So examples of analytic equal to their Taylor series, non-analytic for one reason or another, it's either not equal to its Taylor series, or uh, the Taylor series just doesn't exist because your derivatives don't exist. 
So that's where you want to keep your eyes open and just make sure that you're either working uh, with an analytic function and you recognize that, or you're not with an analytic function and you recognize that. So next definition is referring to a, a domain or a boundary as analytics. So usually we refer to functions as analytic, but of course we can extend this to the domain or the boundary. And we saw this all the way back in, in chapter one when we were defining domains, omega. Recall they were open connected subsets of R or Rn. We define them as the pre-image of a function, right? Or a super level set, super level set of a function f. And in particular, defining it that way, let us define the boundary of the domain as just the level set of level zero of some function f. Okay, so this is really giving us some sort of um, association of a domain to a function and its boundary to a function. And because of that association, we can just call the domain or the boundary analytic whenever f is analytic. So we're going to say that the domain or the boundary is called analytic whenever f is analytic. Now, in the event that f is analytic on a subset of omega or a subset of the boundary, we actually say that the boundary or the uh, domain is, is locally analytic. Okay, so what do I mean to be analytic only at, at some point? This means that, okay, so the derivatives of f may exist at some point x naught, but maybe not at a different point, x1 or something. So you can take your derivatives at x naught, maybe not at x1 or something. So locally, wherever you manage to be able to take your derivative to make your function analytic, that's what we're gonna call this locally. So let's look at an example of an analytic domain. Uh, this is the three-dimensional ball of uh, radius one. So you're looking at all points in R3 that sum of squares are less than one. Everybody's favorite probably. So it's that entire set in R3. And this is gonna be an analytic domain because the function, which let's recall, we just rearrange that to be one minus x squared, parentheses, plus y squared plus z squared. As long as we set that up as f, we do in fact recover the domain as the super level set, and then the boundary is the level set, level zero. And the function here, if I put my parentheses in the right spot, is analytic. So since that's an analytic function, we can call our domain and boundary analytic as well. We look at a locally analytic domain. So a locally analytic domain will be this kind of the unit square, it's another favored domain, but maybe this is my x-axis and my y-axis. What does the unit square look like? It's the interior of this square of side length one. So there's the unit square, and that is going to be locally analytic. Why locally? Well, if we try to compute derivatives of the function which defines this set at the four corners, right? So the four corners there, and in fact, actually anywhere along these, these cross lines, if I define my function like that. If I try to compute derivatives of the function at those, at those cusps, it's not differentiable. I'll just say at corners here. So that's not gonna be differentiable at corners, so not analytic there. It will be analytic everywhere else, because if I just look at these flat lines, then definitely I can compute my function along these flat lines. So you can compute derivatives anywhere except for those cusps. And in fact, you would be equal to your Taylor series everywhere except for those cusps. That's what it means to be locally analytic. And then we move onwards to another criteria that the cauchy kolev theorem is gonna ask of us. And this jumps way back to chapter two in the book, or three, chapter three in the book with non-characteristic conditions, right? So really cauchy sky is kind of the closest thing we have to the method of characteristics in for higher order PDEs and perhaps for uh, systems of PDEs, in fact, even though we won't get into them here. Um, so we're looking at the non-characteristic condition. It's going to be the same, it's actually the same statement in higher order, but it looks a lot uglier. So we're gonna start with our PDE, which you'll recall is a function of maybe our spatial variable our scalar field we're trying to solve and all of its derivatives, right? So scalar field, this is space, all derivatives. And for, you know, without lots of generality, you can set that equal to zero, absorbing some constant into F. And what we need to do to talk about the non-characteristic conditions, we need to establish the outward unit normal. 
This is the outward unit normal direction of partial omega or omega of omega. And then we're going to compute you know, the top power of our derivatives in that direction. So whichever term has the top order of derivatives in the outward unit normal direction, we're going to give that the name p sub n, n for normal there. So notably, this n and this n are different. One's bold face and the other isn't. So the bold face is a vector. It's the outward unit normal vector. The power is just the nth order p e. We're going to give this, out, this outward unit normal derivative to the nth power the name p sub n. We're going to rearrange our function so that that term is isolated. So the dependence on that term is, is isolated. And you can see basically what have I done there is I've subtracted off that specific direction from my nth order derivatives. Now the non-characteristic condition says if I take a partial derivative in this final direction, however f depends on that final term, and I take a partial derivative there, and as long as that's not equal to zero for everything in the boundary, I'm going to call that the non-characteristic condition. So this is the exact same non-characteristic condition we've seen in the past. It's just kind of expanded up to nth order, which makes it look a little bit ugly. Let's see this in action. And to do that, we're going to consider the second order nonlinear PDE as given here. So this is definitely a PDE that's nonlinear. So chapter four can't help. Second order is chapter three can't help. It's definitely something we've not really encountered so far in this book. And we're going to analyze this over the unit disk. So x squared plus y squared is less than one. And ask ourselves the question, is the non-characteristic condition satisfied? Well, we know from example 1.2.19 that this, the outward unit normal of the unit disk is really just the vector x, y, or if we fix an x naught, y naught in the boundary, it's x naught, y naught, and the tangent is either a negative y naught, x naught, or, or uh, y naught, negative x naught, because there are two tangent directions. And so having constructed n and t, we can actually construct the restricted gradients, which is the gradient in the outward direction and the gradient in the tangent direction, as the directional derivatives of these two vectors, or I can label them as partial n and partial t. If you compute that directional derivative, you get x naught partial x plus y naught partial y in the outward unit normal direction, and in the tangent direction, negative y naught partial x and positive x naught partial y in the tangent direction. So it's going to be a little easier for us to write partial n and partial t here in two dimensions rather than using the gradient notation. So with that in mind, we can relabel partial x as x naught partial n minus y naught partial t, and partial y is y naught partial n plus x naught partial t. Now, why am I making these relabelings? Why am I writing partial x and partial y in terms of the outward unit normal in the tangent directions? That's because the original PDE involved derivatives in x and y, it did not involve derivatives in the outward unit normal direction or the tangent direction. So what I need to do is I need to convert this, convert the PDE into partial n and partial t notation. Now why do I need to do that if I'm going to try to satisfy the non-characteristic condition? Well, see, the, the way it's stated is that I have to relabel this term. This is the highest order term. in the outward unit normal direction. So to be able to relabel the highest order term in the outward unit normal direction, I need to find the highest order term in the outward unit normal direction. Currently, in this PDE, it's not explicit. It's hidden in there somehow. So what I do is I rewrite both x and y, partial x and partial y, in terms of the outward unit normal. Of course, it has to play games with the tangent direction as well. But you write partial x and partial y in terms of the outward unit normal, and then you make the substitution, right? So those two versions of partial x and partial y, I'm going to substitute both of them in in terms of partial n and partial t. So when I make that substitution, that's my term for partial n, my term uh, for partial x and partial y. I'm going to make that substitution, I'm going to expand and rearrange everything. There they are expanded, nice and foiled. And then I rearrange it so that I can really isolate that partial n term, the highest order I'm isolating. highest order term in partial n. That's what I care about for the characteristic condition. So I'm going to isolate that term, bring it all the way over to the left hand side. Everything else I've kind of combined into their respective terms as well, but those aren't nearly as important as this highest order term in the outward unit normal direction. And then, right, the non-characteristic condition says you make the following substitution. You call that term, the highest order term in the outward unit normal direction, you call it p sub n. So you're going to write it as something in the variable of p sub n. You're replacing this specific term with that. So that's what I've done here. 
And when we replace it, we now take a partial derivative in that direction. So you'll notice partial derivative will, will find that term, but it's going to kill everything else. because Nothing else depends on that term. So we're basically just left with its coefficient. We ask the question, is this ever equal to zero on the boundary? Is that ever equal to zero on the boundary? Well, we can check. How can we check? We don't. We know what x squared and y squared are. We don't necessarily know what phi squared or phi is until we recall that, in fact, the, the PBE at the beginning had given us phi. Right? This is why that Cauchy data is so important. So that the original PDE gives us phi on the boundary. And so we just grab that term, x squared plus 1, and we plug it in. So we plug x squared plus 1 in for phi. And when we do that, we expand. We get x naught squared plus x naught squared y naught squared plus y naught squared. And let's recall that we're on the boundary for those two terms. Right, the boundary here is defined by x squared plus y squared equals 1. So those two terms are going to add up to give me a 1. I end up with 1 plus x naught squared y naught squared. So this term is definitely always positive. Positive numbers, by the way, are never equal to 0. So that's where I can verify that this, this specific term that I'm looking for in my non-characteristic condition, this partial piece of n of f, is not equal to 0 for all of x on the boundary. I just went through the work on this PDE to show that that was true. Now, if you recall in the characteristic method, method of characteristics section of the book, I mentioned that it's not very common to actually perform the non-characteristic conditions. They're always hellish calculations. They're really, really hard calculations. And so we try to avoid them. And we, we can. The thing is, you can always apply these techniques. And you just find out if it's not satisfied by running into a brick wall. The technique just won't work if it's not satisfied. So I usually avoid actually verifying it. And I'd rather just run a brick wall. Um, but you can always verify it if you want to. You saw the example where I just calculated it. Anyway, let's actually talk about the cauchy kolesnikov sky theorem now. Before we get there, I just want to recall what we've actually done. Recall so far. We defined analytic functions, analytic boundaries, and domains, and the non-characteristic condition. So there's definitely a reason why I had to go through all three of these for you. And we're going to see why. It's because the cauchy kolesnikov sky theorem needs all three to be relevant. So we're going to start with a, a nice PDE here. So there's a, a function consisting of all those spatial terms, all of my scalar fields, and all of the derivatives. So that's a PDE. And then we have these boundary terms. And this boundary terms is called, often called Cauchy data. Now, what do I mean by Cauchy data here? What I mean is we have full information of all outward unit normal derivatives up to one, one degree lower than the order of the PDE. So we have full information. Cauchy data means full information of outward unit normal derivatives of the solution through order one less than order of PDE. So you grab the order of the PDE, and you get exactly one fewer order terms of the outward unit normal derivative of your solution. So that's called Cauchy data on a problem. These are often called Cauchy problems because of Cauchy data and, and whatnot. So Cauchy studied them a lot, hence his name attached to it. Um, so you have a PDE of this form where you've got the Cauchy data. And then you're asking a few questions about this PDE. We need that this function f of all of those variables needs to be an analytic function in those variables. You also need every single one of these Cauchy datas, f sub k. Those need to individually be analytic functions. And furthermore, when you look at your domain, or in fact your boundary, you need that the boundary is an analytic boundary. So we covered the definition of all of those. And of course, they're going to be satisfied in a lot of situations. Uh, because you know polynomials or your favorite cosine sine functions satisfy those. And then we also see the non-characteristic condition show up. So anywhere on the boundary where the non-characteristic condition is satisfied, you can actually construct a Taylor series which represents the solution. Now, this Taylor series is centered, right? So we're centering the Taylor series at a point on the boundary. So you center it at that point on the boundary. But the Taylor series, once you do it, can be explicitly computed from the information contained in the PDE. This is actually really important. It says you can actually find every single term in this Taylor series from the PDE itself and the boundary conditions. 
And that's not good enough to, for mathematicians, right? We actually need to know that this converges, right? If, if just because I can write a series down doesn't mean it tells me anything until I know it converges. And I do know it converges absolutely and uniformly. Now, if you don't know what those terms mean, I guess in calculus two, you should have covered absolute convergence. Uh, uniform convergence is a real analysis topic, but it happens within a small enough region of this point. And furthermore, it does in fact solve the PDE, right? So anywhere that this converges, it actually does solve the PDE there as well. So really what this is saying is that the power series method, which would be starting with that and then explicitly computing things, is valid because it converges and solves. So the power series method is valid. That's what Cauchy Kovalev's guidance says. Now, I'm not going to go through the proof. You can look into the proof if you want. It gets a little bit involved. You can see I'm doing a lot of um, direct sums with gradients. Um, it's really pretty tricky. This is even just a, a proof of you know, the very first bullet point there. The second two bullet points are even harder. They deal with something called majorization of power series. So we're really not going to cover this proof at all. But the statements are pretty important, right? The statements are that you can explicitly compute these and the solution converges and actually solves the PDE. So where I head to next is this remark, which is really a power series method step by step. So we're going to look at a step-by-step -step for how to actually do step one, which is construct the power series. And the way this is going to work is we want to make sure, step one is we want to make sure that f, f, k, and the boundary are analytic. Now let's just recall where those terms come from. It was f of a vector, my solution, it's gradient, dot, 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 the gradient to the nth power equals zero. And then I've got the Cauchy data over here, which is the outward unit normal to the kth power of my solution on the boundary is equal to f sub k on the boundary. So you start by looking at those, right? And this is x in the boundary. You start by verifying that f and fk and the boundary are actually analytic. You want to know where that's true. So it could be locally analytic. So you're going to take some point at which all of them are analytic in step two. You're going to center your Taylor series at that point. You also need to choose a specific order to approximate to. Maybe you want to do to linear terms, quadratic terms, cubic terms. So it'd be a Taylor series of through n equals one, n equals two, and n equals three, but you can keep going higher if you wanted to, get better and better approximations. And then in step four, you're going to write out the general Taylor series with as of yet undetermined coefficients all the way through that order. So that's just going to be, hey, I'm going to write it through cubic terms. I don't know my coefficients yet, but I'll write it through cubic terms. Then in step five, we're going to compute that ordered unit normal and all tangential directions along with their respective gradients, because we have to actually make computing every single term in the Taylor series straightforward, and they're all gonna arise out of our boundary conditions, and the boundary conditions care about that specific gradient. Step six, we're going to be able to compute quite a few terms, so we're gonna be computing the coefficients corresponding to the outward unit normal at the point that we're centering things. So if we can compute those specific coefficients, we're going to get a lot of the terms in the Taylor series. We won't get all of them, but we'll get a lot of them. And they can be immediately calculated by the boundary conditions themselves. They're included in the PDE. It gets a little bit trickier from there, because in step seven, we're going to be able to act specifically the tangential gradient. Right. So this is where you need a really good grasp of the difference between the normal gradient and the tangential gradient. You can use the tangential gradient on all of our boundary terms to get a lot of other coefficients. So I should mention the left-hand side is Taylor series terms. The right hand side is computed terms from boundary conditions. So you can compute a lot of the Taylor series terms from the boundary conditions. In step six, they were given to you by the boundary conditions. In step seven, you can actually compute a few more in tangential directions. And then in step eight, we finally have to use the PDE itself. So we use the PDE itself to find the, the, the last collection of undetermined coefficients. And they're all going to take the following form. There's going to be j powers in the tangential direction, and then there's going to be n plus k powers in the normal direction. And, and it's always going to be like that. I say n plus k, this n is the order of the PDE. So the, the smallest that these terms can ever get are when j is 0 and k is 0, and you're looking at terms of the form the gradient in the, in the normal direction of phi at x naught uh, to the nth power. So that's the smallest order of these terms that you're, you're going to be calculating. So by the non-characteristic condition, how do we know that we can actually find these? But by the non-characteristic condition, you can always write the PDE where you isolate 
that collection of terms to the left hand side. And then G is some modification, some rearrangement of other terms. Right, so everything else you can push to the right hand side, and that's what we're calling G, but specifically this nth order normal derivative of phi can always be isolated. This is why the non-characteristic condition is defined the way it is. And this is the point in, in the in the in the process that you'll find out if you fail your non-characteristic condition. But once you pull this off and you I guess you figured out your non-characteristic condition satisfied, you can simply compute all terms of the form. Right? So those are the terms that aren't included here. So these extra terms are the ones that are not already included. What you do is you compute that on G. And in fact, because of steps six and seven, you've actually already computed. You already know these values by steps six and seven. So because of steps six and seven, you already know the right-hand side's values. And that means you now know the left-hand side's values. At this point, since you know everything, this is between that, um, that, and that, this will consist of all Taylor series coefficients. So you officially found all Taylor series coefficients. That means you can construct a Taylor series. I didn't say it was easy, but you're able to do it. So that's a step-by-step -step method. And we're saving the examples for the next video, but I will go through a couple more definitions, make your life a little bit easier. I know it's already a little bit overwhelming. We're gonna make your life a little bit easier. And this one kind of harkens back to even, even chapter two in the book. I did describe the Taylor series in D dimensions and chapter two is the following expression with outer products and scalar products. But you can actually figure out what these would all turn into if you actually computed them. What you get here is a product. Okay, so that's once again, production notations. So you're taking products instead of sums, multiplication instead of sums of specific partial derivatives in each direction of phi. And then however many partial derivatives you take in the xi direction, that's the same power you give to the xi minus where the Taylor series is centered. And then that's also the same factorial you put in the denominator. And so you can really think about this as like all combinations of all orders of partial derivatives of all powers. And then you're just able to inform what is the power of the xi term in the Taylor series. Well, it's just the same power in the partial derivative in the xi direction. And then you always pick up the factorials as well. Okay, so I said I would make that easier. I don't think that does make it easier. What I did do though, is give the following example. See the notation's dense, but we do provide examples. So in t equals two, two dimensions, I've gone up to cubic terms here. So you can see all Taylor series terms through cubics. And in dimension three, I've gone through all Taylor series terms in quadratics, um, just because there's a lot more and I would start to fill up the page if there were too many. So that's me going through quadratics. So what you wanna think though, when you, when you actually look at these, you should start to recognize patterns in the cubic and, and uh, quadratic cases for two and three dimensions. What are we doing? We're doing all possible combinations of partial derivatives. And the power of the partial derivative corresponds to the power of the same variables, monomial term, and respective factorial. So all combinations, partial x, partial y is a combination. It's x to the first power, y to the first power. Y, z is a combination. It's y to the first power, z to the first power. X is a combination. It's x to the first power. X, y squared is a combination. It's x to the first power. It's y squared. That's two factorial. Here is y to the cube power. That's y cubed, three factorial. So you're just going through all possible combinations, making sure that you divide by the respective factorials where the factorials are coming from the powers, right? So there's a two, there's a two factorial. There's really a one here and a one factorial here as well. So that's where all the terms are coming from when you decide to expand in higher dimensions. So that's where we're gonna stop today. Give you a nice little view of the PDE. We're gonna find a, an approximate solution to in the next video. So you can look forward to that. I'll see you then, bye.